Good morning. Whoa, that's, that's hot. Good morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord today, is it not? And it's great to see so many uh, f- folks here in attendance with us. Uh, if you're in attendance with us here in the audience and this is your first time here, uh, we would love to have information about your visit. Uh, in the pew in front of you is one of these forms right here. Uh, if you please fill it out, we're going to ask you to take it to the kiosk. We're going to have somebody at the kiosk. They're going to give you a, 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 a little gift, a thank you gift, and we're going to take this, and we're going to contact you with information about the church and ask you want to visit from one of the ministers. If you say, hey, no, I don't, I'm not really interested, we'll respect your wishes. If you say, yeah, I'd like my information, we'll cover you up with as much information as you want, okay? So we have that for you there. Um, if you're at home watching, you can't fill out one of these forms. So we ask that if you're watching from home, that if you would please uh, tell us who you are and the number of people watching with you so we can get a record of your visit that way. Also, uh, just for uh, situational awareness for you, if you're wanting to pay your tithe uh, due to the fact that we don't want to pass the plates through the rows, we have two offering plates set up at the back of the congregation for you on your way out or during the grip and grin time for you to put your tithe there. Folks will take that into the office, and that'll be counted. If you're at home and you would like to pay your tithe, you can easily swing by the church office or make uh, contact with Lori McGinnis, and she will make arrangements to to help you uh, be able to put your tithe uh, into the uh, congregation uh, uh, plate, if you would do that. Now that that's done, it's been a very interesting week, has it not? It's been for me. I turned in a paper and still waiting whether or not I passed or failed. It's huge on my mind. I made another trip around the sun. I'm 30 again. Um, I've got a lot of things going on. I've got, got 3,000 pages to read for the next class. I've, I've got all this stuff. And, and you go, wow, you know, it's, it's, okay. But I've got other stuff going on in my life that's, that's more important. And I, and I, and I agree. Some of, some of you have a lot of things on your plate. And the temptation in this time is to allow this time to be an opportunity for you to fret and worry and be concerned and let all that stuff become an all-consuming power that diverts your attention away from the worship of the one true God. During this time, this is where the body comes together to corporately worship God as one body. We're here to sing praises to the audience of our praise, which is the Father. We're here to lift our hearts and minds during the response of reading as praise to the Father. We're here as we hear Scripture read and hear it expounded to worship God as the audience of our worship. And it's very easy for us to let all the things from the week creep in and distract us and keep us or sometimes even rob us from the joy that we would have in the worship of the one true God. My challenge to you this morning is the same challenge I would give myself is focus intently on the purpose of why we are here this morning. And focus in on the intent of worshiping the one true God in spirit and in truth as Brother Raymond comes to lead us in our opening prayer. Good morning. If you would, close your eyes and bow your heads. Father God, thank you again for this morning, Lord. We thank you for the ability to come into these walls, Lord, to come together, to worship together, Lord. Especially during this time of separation, um, this this holds even more meaning for us, Lord. And we, we do appreciate the opportunity that you've allowed us, Lord. This morning, though, we just ask that you would control our minds, control our hearts, in our ears, Lord. Help us to be ready and willing to hear this message. Help us to hear this message in a way that we can return this message to the world around us, Lord. Help us to have an eagerness and a, and a hunger to do that. As we start our Sunday school this, this week, Lord, help us to uh, be, be getting used to the, the things that we used to do, the, 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 uh, the time restraints that, uh, that we used to have, Lord. Let us, let us uh, take those times and, and, and dive into our Sunday school, dive into our, our worship, dive, in, dive into our, our studies, Lord. 
Help us to get back to the old lifestyles to where uh, we're mission-oriented, we're mission-focused, Lord. That can only happen if we're focused on Sunday mornings to the word that you've given us, Lord. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Now, if you would please stand. All right. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and his sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Now, if you would extend the right hand of Christian fellowship. All right, we're going to go ahead and make our way back to our seats. Um, As you are going back to your seats, we're going to be singing a new song. We're going to be singing Graves into Gardens. Uh, We've been working on it for the last couple weeks. And I really love this song because it really talks about how no matter what, no matter um, what this world can offer, that there is nothing better than God. There is nothing better than Him. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and worship. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire. Is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Not 
of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. It's who I 
all we can say that is you're a good father lord we love you today lord we ask that you speak through brother ashley as he's about to give us your word lord that you will speak through him in jesus name amen I was going to tell you to please stay standing, but everybody's standing, so great. Um, our reading comes from Genesis 14, 13 through 24. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Aner. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre take their share.
Well, from what I understand, the Cowboys won't play till later today, so I got plenty of time. And since my team is playing at noon, um, you know, I'm confident in their ability to do what they do best. So, you know, I didn't say one way or the other. I don't want to hurt people's feelings. No need to be divisive in the house of the Lord, folks. Jeez. <clears throat> you go, wow. We jumped right in the middle of something. Yes, we did. And the reason why we did is I could either cover all of 14, or I can jump in and cover the section and, and brief you on what's happened up to verse 13. I figured I would brief you to what's happened up to verse 13. So, by the way, if you haven't tried the coffee in the back, it's worth a try. I made it myself. So, anyhow, what's going on? Well, we know that Abram and Lot have split company. We know that Abram and Lot have decided to uh, move into different areas. Lot chose for himself the best land, and notice what happened the last couple of weeks. Lot moved his tent into the valley with Sodom and Gomorrah, and then last week he moved it right outside the city walls. And if you were to continue to read, Lot has now moved inside the city. And what happens is the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are part of a confederation that have broken away from a larger city-state power, regional power, that wants them back. And so they make war against the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they take the city hostage, and they rob the city of all of its possessions to include Lot and all that Lot owns. Now, this is a good time when you have an older brother who's bigger and badder than all the other people that are trying to beat you up. I'm grateful that I had one like that because I could really say just about anything. In my, you know, my... Lot hears about this, and you see the text beginning with a man escapes and goes and tells Abram. And, and we're going to look at this, but, but there's an interesting character. And the reason why I did this is I wanted to discuss who this character is uh, more so. So this sermon is really going to be more informative-based to answer the question of who this man is than it, than it does in other directions. And so um, we have the introduction of this very odd character who actually, just from a very real perspective, outside anything supernatural, brings nothing to the story in Genesis. He's not involved in the fight. He's not involved... In the recovery of the possessions, he kind of inserts himself into the text, and as soon as he's inserted in, he quickly exits. It's an odd way to do. It's an odd thing to introduce this character. And so, what happens is you have several varying views of who this man is, and I will tell you which one's right and which one I think is. No, I'm kidding. Uh, and we'll look at and see who he is. Because I think he has a very distinct role. You've got to remember, my overarching assumption of the book of Genesis is the book of Genesis has a nothing more than prelude for what's coming in the New Testament. You see this with the days of creation and mirrored in, first, uh, in John chapter 1. You see this in chapter 3 with the announcement that there's going to be someone that comes and crushes the head of Satan. You see this in the prophecy of the... Of the, of the, of the um, land possession and the na nationality that is beyond just Israel but to all of us and that the offspring is Christ. You see this constantly through and I think that in 14 we get introduced to someone that's the offspring. You say, well, I disagree. Well, it's okay. It's America. You can be alone. Oh, it's a blank slide. How clever. I forgot to take that slide out. Sorry. It's not, it's not, it's not Tammy's fault though. I would blame her but she's not here. Then one who escaped, by the way, my wife did a really good job reading those names. I am not going to spring my tongue on some of them. We're just going to change their names and, and it'll be okay. Then one who had escaped came to Abram, the Hebrew, first recognition of what he is, right there, pow, uh, who is living in the Oaks of Mamre, the Amorite. So this is not just a location, but also somebody's name. The brother of Eskel and Aner. And these were allies to Abram. Okay, great. So what? Okay, well, again, I've brought you up to speed. These guys are all living in an area away from. This is the area that Abram chose to go live in. 
And after the carnage that happens in Sodom and Gomorrah, this guy comes and tells them what's happened. Now, what I think is cool is in the following passage. So let's take a look here. We may even beat them. No, we're not. We have a business meeting afterwards. Then Abram led his kinsmen who had been, ta- uh, heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, and he led forth his trained men. Now, that's a key phrase. Does that mean he led forth all of his men? No. When you have a qualifier like that, that means that some men are untrained. Well, it's nice when you go to war to have bodies on the battlefield. But a lot of times if you're untrained, you will leave bodies on the battlefield. Trained men, this is important. These men are trained how? What do you think they're, how they're trained? Fighting. Trained in fighting. These men are trained fighting. Now here's the thing that he has. He has 318 of them from his own house. That's a sizable army. Then he leads them in pursuit as far as Dan. By the way, uh, we'll, and we'll talk about this here in a moment. And he divided his forces against them at night. And he, he and his servants defeated them and pursued them to Hobita north of Damascus. Most of the locations, Dan, Hobita, Damascus, these are written to where when the people of Israel come back into the land, they know where these battles were fought. Dan doesn't exist at this time because Dan is named after one of the 12 tribes. So it's written for a future audience. Abram takes 318 trained warriors from his own house. He attacks at night. You need to understand that attacking at night is not a... Nowadays in our modern army, we own the night. We have night vision. We can see you clear as in the daytime. That's not the case in Abram's day. Matter of fact, most fighting stopped at dusk because you had to be able to identify the guy you're stabbing with the sword. And so Abram attacks at night. So therefore, he doesn't need as many men as a full-scale assault. But also, this is part of God's blessing Abram in his victory. And we're going to talk about this here in a moment because it's going to go to who this cat is named that I haven't named yet because I don't want to. And so he lays, not only does he defeat them on the battlefield, but he leads them into a very large fight. So basically, he starts in the south and he moves northward in his discussion. You go, okay, great. Where are we going to get to the point? I'm almost there. I'm almost there. We've got to set the stage. Almost there. Then he brings back all the possessions that, uh, and brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions, the women and children. And after this return from this place that I'm not going to spray my tongue on, you can read it. And the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, very key, went out to meet him in the valley of Shiva. That's the king's valley. Now, why did the king of Sodom come out and meet him? Because it's his possessions Abram has. It's his citizens that Abram has. The king of Sodom has a vested interest in coming out to meeting Abram because it's his stuff. He would like it back. Now, there's an interesting discussion that happens next. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God, or God Most High, depending on how you want to translate that. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the God Most High who has delivered you and your enemies out of your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Well, who is this character Melchizedek? Some of you are aware of the two views that you can take with Melchizedek. Some of you might take, well, he's a man. He's a priest. He's a priest that comes out of Jerusalem. And that's all he is. It's an odd insertion if the guy's just a priest and king who has nothing to do with the conflict that is around him at all. He's not one of the nations that went out to war to subdue the rebel city-states. And he's not one of the rebel city-states that are involved. So why does he insert himself into this passage? Let alone, why does he come out with bread and wine? They don't need food or possessions. Why? They have all the stuff that they had taken from the kings that they whooped the stuffings out of. So why is he inserted here? Why is he here in this passage? If he's just a man, he really genuinely brings nothing to the story. 
which then raises the problem within the text. I think he's God. I think he's the second person of the triune God. I think he's the second person pre-incarnate of the triune God. And you will see, I believe and contend, that every time Abram has an address with a man in human form that is deity, that it's this man. Now, what's my proof for this? Well, we'll begin to take a look at it and break it down. Well, first of all, let's begin with his name. His name is a compound word, uh, Melchizedek. Mel- Melech is the word for king. Zedek is the word for righteousness. So in his name is the word king of righteousness. Well, that's okay. Elimelech is a compound word. El, God, uh, Malek, uh, king, God is my king. That doesn't mean that he's uh, uh, who Christ is. You're right. But Elimelech isn't described as the king of Salem or the high priest of the Most High. Now, part of this also goes into the discussion of how many of you know the three offices that Christ holds? Anyone want to care to guess? The three offices that Christ hold is that of prophet, priest, and king. You have two of them overtly represented here in this passage. He is also known as the king of peace. So he's the king of peace, he's the king of righteousness, and he is the high priest of God most high, or the priest of God most high. Well, here's the thing. Is there a temple in Jerusalem at this time? No. How does that happen? And why would that matter? So there's God worshipers in Jerusalem before the Jews ever took control of Jerusalem. Is that how that works? If he's simply a man? Or is he someone greater than? And I think we'll see from text that he's someone greater than. Notice what he brings out. Now, the, before we start making a huge amount of hay, I think this is very uh, interesting. Now, when the text says bread, it's a common word that's used. It can just mean food in general. Uh, and, and usually the text annotates it as so. But here, the text annotates it as bread and wine. Oddly enough, if you want to hold to the position that the Genesis narrative is foreshadowing to what's occurring in the New Testament, on the night that Jesus betrayed, he took oatmeal and he broke it and dipped it in Capri Sun and said, this is... Is that what he did? No, he took what? And dipped it. So while you don't want to make a whole lot of hay, and this is, again, this is an argument for silence here, there is this odd shadowing forward, especially if you're going to hold to the position that this man is holding two of the three offices of Christ, priest and king. He also inadvertently also fulfills the role of prophet here. Blessed be the God of Abraham, most high, possessor of heaven and earth. For the Lord has delivered your enemies into his hand. Well, how does he know that the Lord delivered his enemies into his hand? How does, how, other than the fact that Abram won, how does this guy, who's the king of the, or, uh, sorry, priest of the Most High, aware of what Abram has vowed? Oh, wait, did I have to give it? Oh, I gave it away. Well, we'll look at it here in a moment. Well, let's look at who this guy is and why we contend that he is Christ and not a man. Well, notice here, this is Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is only talking about whom? We covered, oh, no, we didn't cover Psalm 110. Sorry, you get a pass. We didn't cover that one. It's talking only about Christ. In Psalm 110, the reference is only Christ. Begins with my Lord, uh, the Lord said to my Lord. In reference that it's Christ. Well, notice if it's about Christ, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, when we read the word order, we think like the Benedictine order, the Augustinian order, the Jesuit order, uh, the order of whatever. Don't think of ordering at a restaurant. Wrong, Wrong connotation. But basically... A type of, or a similarity to, or, a, or someone to be compared to. Now that's important because when we get over to Hebrews, Hebrews is going to shift language just subtly. If you're not paying attention to it, you'll blow past it because it's, it's, it's well, 
our minds typically aren't trained to understand what the language is being utilized there. And so we have this here. This is talking only about Christ. This whole chapter is talking about only Christ. And Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, the implication is if he's a priest forever after this order, then this order is... Yeah. That means you have two priests running at the same time. That doesn't happen unless one of them is the same man. Well, let's look and see if Hebrews can help us out. Let's look and see if Hebrews can help us out. I'm glad Hebrews is in there because it can. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, is the priest of the Most High, met Abram after returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. Oh, why did he bless him? Well, we'll talk about it. And to him, Abram apportioned a tenth of everything. Well, that's another key point as to why I think he's Christ. He is first, by translation of his name, the king of righteousness, and then he is also the king of Salem, which is peace. Now, in the following description, you let me know when this meets anyone other than Christ. He is without father or mother or genealogy, but neither having beginning of days nor end. And before you go, well, Jesus had a mom. Jesus is pre-incarnate and has always existed before time. In the garden, when God said, let us make man, he is talking, the Father is having a conversation with the Holy Spirit and the Son because the Son has no mommy or dad. He is pre-existent and self-existent. Well, Melchizedek then would be an odd man because he also is pre-existent and self-existent. Well, that's hard to swallow. Unless you're Benny Hinn, and then there's four members, and nine members of the Trinity, and now we've got the fourth one right there, Melchizedek. Why well, does it work? Resembling the Son of God, he continues to be a priest. How? Huh. Riddle me this, Batman. If he's a priest forever, then what's the purpose of Christ being, fulfilling the role of priest? Here's the other one here. This word resembling... What would be a synonym for resemble? I'll give you a hint. It starts with an L, has an I, has a K, has an E. It's likeness. When we go back to the conversation of the Imago Day, how does God create man? He creates man in his image and after our likeness likeness is phraseology that is used to describe what god is like and who he is and when he makes man he makes man in his likeness and when we pervert the image we pervert the image by making man in the likeness of things created so likeness has some theological baggage so he is in the likeness of the son of god well likeness conveys the actual representation of He's the actual representation of the Son of God. Is that phrase ever used of humanity? No, it is not. So who is he? According to Hebrews so far, he's Christ. He is a priest forever. Why? He fulfills the role of prophet, priest, and king. Let's continue on. See how great this man was who Abram the patriarch gave a tenth of his spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have, can, uh, have a command in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, uh, though these who are descendants of Abraham. But this man, who does not have descendants from them to receive tithes from Abram and blessed him, or sorry, received tithes from Abram and blessed him who, uh, who had promised, it is beyond dispute that the inferior, this would be Abram, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In this case, ties were received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one who testifies that he lives. When the priests in the temple receive ties, that's mortal man to mortal man. When Abram gives ties to Melchizedek, that's mortal man giving to that which is not mortal man, for he lives forever. So who is this weird character that appears? I'll contend that it is Christ. Well, why is that? Well, we'll talk about that here in a moment. I'm glad you're asking those questions. 
Now, if perfection had been attainable through the uh, Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what further need would there to have of another priest to rise in the order of Melchizedek? Odd phraseology. If the Levitical priesthood was so great, why would you need Christ? And if you have Christ, he's in the order of Melchizedek. So he's, uh, he's either duplicating something that existed once or he is what Melchizedek is. So let's move on. We'll, we'll, you can read that part. This becomes more evident that when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest but is not based on legal requirements concerning bodily descent, but from the power of an indestructible life, for it is witnessed, you are a priest forever under the order, you could use the likeness here, of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is made in the likeness of God. Melchizedek is the likeness of the Son of God. Who is he? He's pre-incarnate Christ that has appeared in the Old Testament to Abram in a situation where Abram did Abram reach out and talk to God about this? Well, actually, he did. Then let's take a look at what he says here. And the king of Sodom says to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram says to the king, Notice what he says, I have lifted my hand to the Lord Most High. This is where Melchizedek comes into play. What does Abram do before battle? He seeks the face of God. He lifts his hand before God and he says, I will not take anything. From, the king, from this battle, lest the king of Salem says, I've made Abram rich. Lest I've blessed Abram. Notice that Melchizedek doesn't come to do anything but do what? Bless Abram for what he has done. So you have this nice juxtaposition of two kings and two individuals. You have one that represents the vilest place on earth. Unlike like Disney World, it's the happiest place on earth. Sodom is the vilest place on earth. Go there and get shots. Um, and then you have the king of Salem, who's the king of peace and righteousness. And you have these two juxtapositions of the two characters. Why? Because in a little bit, God's going to wipe this king and his nation off the face of the earth. And Mrs. Lot's going to be salty. I figured I'd wait and let you guys figure that one out. So let's take a look at this. Give me this. I won't take anything. Um, all the other men can have their share, uh, unless you say I've made rich. But I made an oath unto the Lord, and now Melchizedek comes to bless Lot. That's how I read this passage. And then he exits. And we don't see him by name again until Psalm 110. And we don't see him by name again until Hebrews chapter 7. And in Psalm 110, it's a reference to Christ. And in Hebrews chapter 7, it's a reference to Christ. So you're going to have a hard time arguing that this guy is just a man in this text. Secondly, he possesses two of the three offices of Christ. And in one function, he's fulfilling one of the roles of, uh, of prophet. And you say, well, why, why, does that, why does that matter? So what? We see in the book of Genesis this continued foreshadowing of the coming of the Christ. Melchizedek doesn't come in the form of a donkey, he doesn't come in the form of an owl, he doesn't come in the form of a tree, he doesn't come in the form of, a, 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 of any other creature in nature. He comes in the form of what? A man. He comes fulfilling three, two of the three roles, priest and king. You have this foreshadowing in Genesis chapter 14 of the coming Christ and coming of Christ into man for one purpose and to bless Abram. And by the blessing of Abram, now this goes back to the promise God makes with Abram that those who bless you, he will bless and those who curse them, he will. And this promise is given to only Abram or to Abram's offsprings. Offspring, not springs, offspring. And the offspring is whom? It's Christ. You see, you began to see this unfolding behind the text that in Genesis chapter 14, and we'll continue to look, that God is revealing more than just a nice story about how the Jews came into existence and ended up being in the promise or ended up in the land of Egypt and then being slaves and then going into the promised land and then having their own country and then not having their own country and then Jesus shows up and everybody's happy, happy, joy, joy. 
You see from this very beginning of the text this very methodical unveiling of who God is through his revelatory nature and who the Son is through his revelatory nature and how God is beginning to put him out there for all of man to see and to know through his word. Which is one reason why when they tell you that the book story of Genesis doesn't contain anything similar to the New Testament, you can point them to these passages. Which is another reason why when they say the God of the Old Testament is a mean God who doesn't care about the redemption of man, then please tell me how he begins to prophesy of the fact that there is salvation coming in Genesis 3.15. That the offspring, which would be us, are heirs according to the promise which is in Jesus Christ. And now you have Melchizedek showing, coming up, and presenting himself in physical form long before Christ actually shows up on the scene. And Christ does this repeatedly in the Old Testament. He appears to Moses in and and, and, and other fashions. And he appears to Joshua as the captain of the army of hosts. And you begin to see this unveiling of the second person of the triune God long before he ever enters into the stage born of a virgin. You say, that's neat. So what? So what is the God that orders your life has so ordered this text that his, una- his unveiling of what he is doing is not haphazard. You do not get a haphazard God doing this. You do not get a by chance God doing this. You have a God that is orchestrating events to bring about things for his own glory. And no sooner is Melchizedek on the scene than Melchizedek is gone. I would contend that in the next chapter when we begin to look as this man and two other individuals come with him to meet with Abram about the destruction of Lot, that it is the same king that that he's run into. You may disagree with me. That's fine. You can be wrong. That was a joke, by the way. So like I said, the whole purpose of this sermon really was more informative based as to who this man is than it is beyond that other than the fact of the scope of God's revelation to man. And so if you're here today, I told you we would be done quick with this one. This was a short one. So you can all remember that uh, on September whatever that uh, I let you guys out early. But if you're here today and you would like to join the fellowship of Skyline Baptist Church, I'm going to invite you to come forward and, and, and we'd love to have you join the fellowship of the church. If you're here today and would like to know more about the grace of God, I would like to sit and talk to you about that. Uh, At this moment, as the praise band leads us, if you will please stand. Seriously, you muted it in that half second. There you go. Please be seated. Well, one of the more important announcements is that uh, since it's 1140, I'm going to give you till 1150. To, well, maybe a little bit longer. Just turn 41. Uh, so when we're done with the announcements, I'll let you know. We have a business meeting following uh, when I get done. And uh, so we'll exit. We'll take a few minute break and then we'll come back in and um, have our business meeting, and then we'll be done. Uh, if you haven't already been a part, or if you're at home and you're watching and you would like to be part of, of the activities of the church, we've started, uh, restarted a lot of our activities. Uh, so on Wednesday night, we have our meal, which starts at 5. 
And then afterwards, we have Awana at 6. We also have an adult Bible study and the youth at the same time. If you would like to be part of the meal, there's a sign-up sheet out there at the kiosk. Please go ahead and fill that out so they know how much uh, food to get and how much to prepare. Uh, the prices are there within the bulletin. And, of course, you'll pay at the door. So if you'll do that, and if you're a parent, we would really like for you to stay and be either part of the Awana group and help the kids learn their verses, or come to the adult Bible study, uh, and that, that helps us out with, with any issues that might arise here on campus. Sunday school started this morning. It was a great success from the class I had. Hopefully it was, did well for you guys in here. I trust that Raymond and Eric did an excellent job. Uh, if you're still wanting the book, if they're still available, they're 10 bucks a piece, or you can go to Amazon and buy them. Uh, if you're a new member, the, your place would be over here in the uh, FLC for Sunday school, and that's important so that you can be a voting member within the church, huh? Conference room. Conference room. Yeah, whatever. This, the room across the way, whatever. That room over there. Um, and then, of course, we have um, our second annual ladies' tea. See Lori McGinnis for that. And then the second annual men's skeet shoot. I mentioned last week, you go, well, I don't have a shotgun. Don't worry, I got you covered. Um, but just bring, bring ammo. It's getting expensive to, to take folks shooting. So, uh, you know, I don't, you don't have to buy a case, but you can help me out with a couple boxes, okay, if you're going to be using my stuff. So, you know, but uh, anyhow, that will be out at David's place to let David McGinnis know he's back there at the back. I see someone flagging me down because they keep flagging me down. What? There's a ladies' fellowship at your house on September 25th at, at 6 o'clock. And if anybody wants to know where your house is, they're not going to Google your house. They're going to come talk to you, right? Yeah, don't Google your house uh, on, in Google. It'll take you literally to your house. Curious, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Eric volunteered. Oh, Eric volunteered. Oh, okay. That, ah, okay. It's in Eric's capable hands. That's fine. All right. Good deal. Um, any other announcements that I can ignore? All right. Hey, folks, it's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, since it's 1145, how about we start at 12, and then we'll move forward from that. Brother Raymond, will you close us out with a word of prayer?